What is Bakelite? This is the world's first synthetic material, Bakelite, the very first plastic. One summer night in 1907, this material settled in a test tube in my great-grandfather's laboratory. Leo Bakelin really stands at the forefront of polymer chemistry. Other chemists found a wall. Leo leaned against this wall and found a door. So first off, I just want to say that I love the opening of this documentary. I like that a host questioned the street walkers in New York, asking them what is um, big light. Was there another opening you had in mind or was this like what you thought of from the get-go of this um, project? Uh, no, I always wanted this opening. Uh, starting with a mystery, starting with a question. And uh, I got the feeling that if we went into Times Square and just asked the question, we would probably get a lot of people that wouldn't know what Bakelite was. And that was the case. So uh, yeah, it was actually what we had planned out and it worked out pretty well. It was a, it was a cool night, the rainy, rainy night and the, uh, the, the umbrellas going by like in Blade Runner. So I, I dig Times Square a lot to shoot. This is a question for both of you. Um, list two words to describe this documentary, all things speak like. Uh, two words. <laughs> Fun, informative. Okay. I've got three words, eclectic. What was the genesis of this documentary? How did two of you meet and agree to do, <clears throat> do the documentary? My mother wanted to write a biography of her grandfather and she never got to it. <clears throat> so she had all the family archives, his journals, his photographs, his a lot of stuff. Before I went to the Smithsonian, she gave it to my uncle who wrote a thesis about Beethoven. And then when my mother passed away, she gave the archives to me. And, and then it was a natural. I had to make the movie. It was, with me. It was in her honor that I made it. The film is dedicated to my mother. Yeah, uh, you and I lived in the same town uh, back when we made the film. and. Uh, uh, I was making another history documentary and I needed a, a good, good dancers. And uh, you and his wife, Sherry, are terrific dancers. And they were dancing in uh, Dance the Lindy in a film I did. And I think he was after that spying on me to see if I was be a good match to make the film. And so we had what we call the, uh, the dance of the tarantulas, which is that early time when you're trying to figure out whether you can get along with somebody, are they, are they honorable, are they uh, qualified to do a film? Because filmmaking is a difficult uh, proposition. So I think we, uh, we started out on doing research, uh, obviously looking through uh, the journals. Uh, Hugh Carricker uh, had the wonderful uh, journals of Leo Bakeland. Uh, I think what, 69 of them, something like that, uh, separate books. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, we use that as a kind of an armature for the film. Were there other titles before all things on Big Light? Uh, yeah, I think uh, pretty much from the beginning, um, I thought of what kind of a film we're going to make about Bakelite, about this chemist who died in 1944 that's going to keep it interesting and relevant. And we always thought about all the things that are made of Bakelite. And that just hit me uh, that all things Bakelite would be a good title and it kind of intriguing, even though it's a metaphorical title, there's not, you can't always put all things Bakelite in or the film would be uh, 300 million years long. <laughs> but, but the point is to make it interesting and um, to kind of uh, mirror the eclectic nature of the film. I thought that was a good title and uh, you character agreed. So that's what we stuck with. Okay, and Hugh, this is a question for you. Um, at what age did you discover that your great grandfather um, did this, the, you know, discover on um, Big Lake? 
probably, I mean, I knew he had made it, but it didn't really sink in until um, probably my mother telling me stories about him when I was in my 20s. If you were to meet your great-grandfather face to face, what is the one question not related to his inventions that you would like to ask him? Mm. Um, not related to plastics, but I would ask him, what should we do now about the plastics problem? Okay. That would be and, um, my question for him too. <laughs> And funny enough, that's my next question to you, um, John, is if you, if you met him face to face, what is the one question you would have loved to ask him in relation to his inventions? Well, I, I guess I would ask him, how, how do you think it turned out? Uh, were you happy with your life, essentially? Uh, and, and yeah, then the second question would be a follow up of you characters, which is uh, how do we fix this mess we've gotten ourselves into with uh, this mountain of uh, single use plastic? Um, Jeffrey Miko, the author of American on Plastic, was in this documentary. Did you ever use his book as a reference for this film? Uh, yes, we, I read the book and took notes. And then I think John had a pretty good sense of what Jeffrey was to bring to the film. And he brought that out of Jeffrey in the interview. Yeah, we did, we did a number of interviews and we, we really prepped very carefully, Mike, for the interviews. We did went through five or six or seven drafts of the question list, because I think you got to know enough about the subject to ask the right questions and then take right angle turns when something new comes up. And Jeffrey was a great, great resource. And uh, his book, American Plastic, is, is terrific. So we, uh, we were really lucky to have him in the film. And um, Hughes, um, have you ever gone back to visit on Belgium where your great-grandfather um, Leo was born? Oh yes, many times. In fact, I was there in 2007 when they had the 100th anniversary of the invention. And there I met uh, several people, one Belgian and one Dutch, uh, Bekelite Halefter. And we sort of formulated a, part, a loose partnership to make a movie about Baseland. But the Belsons didn't want to support the movie. And the Dutchman had his own ideas. So I came back to the States and chose John as my director. Okay. And are you planning to go there or? Um, not in the near future, but I have friends over there. I've been back about seven times over the last 20 years, uh, 15 years. And this is a question for you again, Hugh. Um, are any one of your relatives following Leo's footsteps in becoming or being a chemist? Um, I have two nephews. One is a um, marine biologist, and the other is a um, managing a pharmaceutical company out in California. Um, so no more chemists in the family. And this is a question for both of you. Um, does either one of you know where his um, science workbook and journals are right now? Well, currently, go ahead, John. They are in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. Next question is: um, If this is for you, John, if you could um, direct a film adaptation of any article, short story, novella, novel, which one would you like to do? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I I'm I'm curious about uh, the little um, songs children sing. Um, I had grew up, uh, I had two, two wonderful daughters, still have them, and they used to do these, uh, these hand songs, you know, back and forth, and uh, I found, found it very interesting to, to hear the lyrics and how 
they were similar in different regions of the country, but slightly different. So I'm, I'm curious about that very much. That, that would be my, my next film if I could do it. Yeah. This vampire, my vampire. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that I would like, that's one thing I'd like to do, yeah. I just want to mention that I like that you already talked about it earlier. You talked about the misuse of plastic in this documentary. What made you decide to do this? And my idea was that the hook to bring people in would be the plastic and then tell the story of the inventor as the other half of the film so that the plastic would be the sexy part. And my great grandfather would be the thinking part. Yeah, we didn't want to leave out, Mike, uh, the, the very, very important problem we were facing, which is uh, plastic misuse. So, uh, you know, we didn't get any money from the plastic industry to make this film. And uh, I think it shows that we, we, we covered, tried to cover all, the, all bases and uh, had a little scene at the end of the film where we bring Leo back metaphorically into Times Square as a time traveler and he's walking around seeing all the amazing things uh, that the future held and uh, you know we often wonder what he would think of what's going on today with his invention. I want to um, hear your thoughts on this issue. What, what do you think could um, we do to solve this problem? Well, in the movie, we show a research chemist at IBM who holds up two and is working on developing biodegradable plastics. And that is the best thing that we can do right now to solve the plastic problem, figure out how to make it recyclable. And then the other thing is maybe not everything has to be made out of plastic too. Right. Uh, I had to end up going to, I was in Santa Domingo when I first saw a, a paper straw. And so not necessarily everything has to be made out of plastic. Right. This is a question for you, um, Hughes. Um, I know that you acted in the past mm -hmm. and um, I'm wondering all the characters that you played on TV series and movies, which one was your favorite and why? Um, I played McMurphy in One Flew Over the Hoo-Hoo's Nest in Summerstar. That was a thrill. Uh, in movies or television, uh, I made a lot of commercials. And one was just for men, the hair dye. <laughs> and that ran like crazy. That was fun. In, this for, um, question for the both of you. In one word, how would you describe your experience working on this documentary? Ah, Go ahead, John. It was uh, it was it was fun. It was uh, daunting. Uh, it took a lot of uh, stubbornness on everyone's part to get through it. A lot of little elements. We we were really lucky to have a tremendous editor in Craig Mkhitaryan, who's my longtime editor and uh, composer Martin Fiji, all original music. So those guys have worked with me for many years and can tolerate me. Uh, you, you character only had to bother with me for a couple of years uh, in making the film, but it's, uh, that's where it's important to have a good, a good um, combination of personalities working together that, that can get the job done and also get along and have fun to boot. Yes, uh, I'll do all of that and be a a boss is not an easy position to be in. That's why they play CEOs a lot of money, <laughs> because I have to be very sensitive to the people who work for me. So John and my media manager, Mark Huberman, everybody who supports the movie has been terrific. And I've learned an awful lot. and grown even more humble than I am by their wonderful work on the movie.
Well, you, you is a master collaborator. Uh, I have to give him a lot of credit for, for putting up with everything that's involved in the, the making and the marketing of a film. Actually, the marketing of a film these days is almost as big of a job as actually producing it. No, Wells so, uh, well said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah. And I just want to say that watching this documentary, I believe that it is not only for those interested in science, but also like entrepreneurs or those who are, who wants to achieve like something great in their lives. Leo's um, hard work and never giving up attitude to find the solution will inspire anybody in their endeavor, whether it's like scientific in nature or, or otherwise. So my, life, my last question to you is, where could people watch this insightful documentary? Oh, yeah, we're up, we're up in five languages internationally now on iTunes, Apple TV Plus, Google Play, YouTube, and Voodoo Domestic. So it's out there, and we really uh, and encourage everyone to get a look at it, at least take a look at the trailer. I think they find it uh, entertaining and, and, um, and uh, educational as well. Yes, I, I agree with that, and we're considering uh, putting subtitles in Arabic and other languages because there are people all over the world who forget something from the movie, as you say, Mike. It's a very broad scope um, dealing with a lot of subjects besides plastic. Bakelite was the first real molding material from which one could make virtually any shape one desired. So Bakelite provided an open-ended play field for American designers. This is a Bakelite guitar made in 1940, a Rickenbacker. Plastic has promised that we can mold, make, or create anything we can envision. It's that cover your grandmother puts on her couch. Plastics is both the finest and the worst expression of humankind. A world without Bakelite would require an alternate universe. Bakelite! 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 Don't forget to subscribe to Novel Pro Junkie. Press the notification button. Like, comment, and share if you will. Thank you.